It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 316 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 11th of November, 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And pain specialist, Dr. Mick Vag. How are you going, Ed? Very good. Did I say doctor? I'm sorry. I should have said conjoint clinical associate professor, oh, Mick just, Vag. <laughs> just, just associate professor is fine. They, they qualified it with as many things as they could qualify it with. I, just to make it harder to fit on the business card, I assume. Clinical <laughs> conjoint associate professor. So it's like we don't want to say that you're a professor, but you know what? We're going to put as many caveats on it as we can, but we can't <laughs> stop you calling yourself professor. It's like we want to recognize your contributions. We just don't want you to get too big a head about it. It's just, you know. so, and we just And we just want to make it clear that, um, you know, we're only doing this because, you know, you're a good bloke and all the rest of it, <laughs> not because you're an academic, not because you fit in around here, oh. but we're just going to put as many caveats on it as we can. No, that's, that's what it is. It's well, funny. All that said and done, congratulations on your appointment. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, but I am milking it as much as I can. Yeah. The, the girls on our reception desk are loving it. They're going, uh, when people are ringing up saying, oh, have an appointment with Dr. Vag, and they say, I'll just check Professor Vag's diary. <laughs> <laughs> You're writing ass prof it. on everything? <laughs> oh, totally, totally. <laughs> ass pro. All right. Well, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone to go to scienceontop.com slash donate uh, to help us make the show. Your contribution for each episode keeps us going and helps us to pay the bills. So we're very grateful to everyone who's chipped in. But Mick, something I've been wanting to get you on to talk about for a while now is something that we've heard a lot about over the last few years, the so-called opioid epidemic or opioids crisis. So tell us, how real is it? How worried should we be about it? And what should we be doing about it? Sure. The first, the first thing I think that's really important to understand is that we are not the US. Uh, the US has um, what is really an unprecedented public health disaster due to opioids. And it's, it's really hard to exaggerate just how bad the effect of... Um, you know, opioid prescription and in increasingly illicit prescription-like opioids, if you like, uh, that, are, that that are causing absolute havoc in the US. It's 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 really on a scale that could never happen here because of the prescribing laws that we have here and the drug regulation we have in Australia. So, is that where it's coming from? Is it the overprescription of opioids, or is it like synthetics and smuggled stuff? Yeah. In most of the world, the opioid crisis is that they're not allowed to use them for legitimate pain. Um, so, so most of the world, opioids are actually illegal to use, no matter how severe uh, the pain is or whether it's cancer pain or acute surgical pain, whatever you're talking about. Most of the world, it's actually illegal to prescribe strong opioids. So um, the overprescription of strong opioids is really very much a first world problem particularly the US, um, UK, some parts of Europe and Australia. So um, in the US, it is exacerbated by the fact that there are increasingly um, cartels which import prescription opioids like fentanyl, um, which is a very strong, very short-acting opioid which was originally produced for use in anesthesia. And there's a lot of um, fentanyl coming into the US which is made in countries like, um, I think most of it actually comes from China, uh, and it's being imported via Africa, Mexico and other areas into the US. So we are not them. We In Australia, we do have, you know, we have our own little opioid situation, um, but it's not on the scale and, and certainly not the severity of the US where, you know, really the, the opioid situation in the US is, is arguably the biggest public health disaster in three or four decades in the US. It's, it's, it's really extraordinary. Um, but it couldn't happen here because the type of prescribing practices which they have, the type of um, advertising of 
pharmaceuticals, which they allow, which we don't, um, all that up to things which really couldn't couldn't be replicated anywhere but the US. So while they deal with theirs, you know, we, we should concentrate on ours. But but the issue in Australia is that that no doubt um, prescribing of opioid medications has increased dramatically since the early part of the 2000s. And, and really that is partly because they were invented to try and meet a need which was pressing at the time and, and still continues to be a problem, which is that, you know, according to the best evidence we had 15 years ago, uh, it did seem to be relatively safe and effective to take these drugs which were originally created for use in acute and post-acute pain. So, you know, pain within the first three months or so after after you got it. Um, and it did seem, as far as we could tell, based on the best evidence at the time, to be reasonably safe to escalate those doses over time with drugs like OxyContin, Emiscontin and Capanol, um, and more recently fentanyl patches and some other um, types of patch. And, and it did seem to be safe to do that. Um, we now understand, actually, that was a really bad idea. And, in fact, the... Uh, the list of things that long-term, medium to high-dose uh, opioids can actually do um, is pretty significant. We now understand actually that uh, long-term high-dose opioids um, increase the risk of depression. They impair emotional modulation pathways. Um, they increase the activation of glial cells in the central nervous system, which facilitates the long-term lowering of the pain threshold. In other words, being on these drugs long-term actually lowers your pain threshold, makes your pain worse. Oh, so you're more um, sensitive to other pain as well. Exactly, yeah. But is oh, that wow. forever? Like, or does it get better? Uh, no, no, no. It can, if, you, if you reduce them appropriately, and this is one of the things we've been learning how to do over the last few years, is if you reduce the opioids at a nice, slow, steady rate, let's say 10 to 20% per month, um, then the body actually can readapt and you can actually get your opioid sensitivity back again. Um, but you have to do it very slowly. So the traditional uh, opioid detoxification regimes, um, which come from addiction treatment, are actually inappropriate for chronic pain management because they don't allow you that time that, that your body needs to actually reset all its opioid systems. But they, they also actually have emotional uh, effects where they, they downregulate reward pathways. So they lead to sort of a reduced commitment to motivated behaviour, impaired attention and working memory as well. So, so they're actually, um, you know, it was one of those situations in medicine where it's a little bit like with, you know, when prednisolone was introduced, which was the first really potent, uh, you know, corticosteroid anti-inflammatory, where... You know, if you push a system in the body too hard from an exogenous source, you end up with all sorts of unforeseen problems down the track because we never realised just how widespread some of these circuits are in the body. So with opioids, we've now dramatically modified our view as to firstly how useful they are because the one thing that a painkiller shouldn't ever do is make the pain worse. Um, mm. Yet that's the situation we find ourselves with these medium to high doses in the long term. So, so, you know, when you go in for your operation, if you're not on opioids, you, you, you know, you're what we call opioid naive, then you shouldn't be worried about getting them short term, uh, you know, to get over the surgery, get yourself back going again. Uh, that's fine. That's actually what they're very good at. But it's when you get people whose pain extends beyond that three months, six months into a year, uh, they're the ones where the usefulness of the opioids, which is seems apparent early on becomes a real problem down the track and so you know as a as a pain specialist these days i spend far more time taking people off stuff than i did putting them on it and 15 years ago when i started you know when i, when I started in pain medicine i was doing a lot of putting people on stuff and you know cranking up the doses because we felt confident to do that at the time but mm. uh not anymore the problem is, of course, that what the pain specialists decide to do, the rest of the profession is five to ten years behind. So we we find that there are still, uh, you know, a lot of GPs, a lot of other specialists who still 
have that view from 10 to 15 years ago that you can you can stick people on these drugs and crank the doses up without too many consequences so so that's really where we are in australia we're getting we're getting an increase in inadvertent opioid overdoses some of which are fatal um and that's really driving this whole rethink about what we do with opioids so you've been talking about your sort of your high grade stuff like your oxycodone your hydrocodones and fentanyl and things in australia we've recently had a big shift in the um sale of codeine uh, you can't yeah. get it without yep. a prescription now. Is this the same sort no. of thing? or? Yeah, that's part of the same rethink. I was actually quite uh, quite involved with that on, on behalf of the Faculty of Pain Medicine and, um, and the TGA. Really, the, the situation there is that codeine is a – so there are three types of mu receptors, correction, three types of opioid receptors, and this will become a bit important with the other stuff I'm going to talk about a bit later on about the new generation opioids. But um, there are mu – kappa and delta receptors which are all opioid receptors but they just have different qualities different things that they do um, how effective a drug is at providing pain relief depends on how strongly it, it stimulates the activity of the mu opioid receptor the kappa and delta do other things they're not really that important for pain relief now, codeine is incredibly weak at the mu receptor, but it's quite strong at the kappa and delta receptors. So for things like constipation, cough suppression, uh, itch, fluid retention, the, the other things that opioids can do, um, including addiction potential, uh, codeine is actually quite a strong opioid. It's just a very, very weak mu receptor opioid. So it led to the belief that it was actually fairly safe and harmless when you when you chucked it in a tablet combined with paracetamol. Now the issue with codeine is it's actually a very weak analgesic, but a strong opioid overall. So um, the only reason that most people get pain relief from codeine is that their liver metabolizes maybe 10 15 percent of that codeine into morphine and it's that it's that 10 to 15 percent of morphine that you get from the codeine that gives you the pain relief so for example you in, in a panadine fort tablet which is one of the very commonly prescribed brands uh, that's 30 milligrams of codeine you'll get 30 milligrams of codeine 30 milligrams of codeine related side effects but you might get three to five milligrams worth of pain relief and you will get 10 to 15 percent of the population who gets zero percent side effect uh, zero percent um pain relief sorry um and my wife is one of those people she, she gets no pain relief from codeine at any dose and that's about 15 percent of the population you get some other people who are ultra metabolizers who get perhaps 80% of that codeine turned into morphine. So they get a big dose of morphine from their codeine. So it's a really unpredictable, unreliable type of opioid. And, uh, you know, in bringing it up to prescription only, taking it out of pharmacies, we're really falling into line with the rest of the world because it is a, it's, a, it's an unreliable opioid for pain relief. Um, and it's as strong and as addictive at the other opioid receptors as all the strong opioids. So in my opinion, it was a very good idea to actually make it prescription only. All right, fair enough. So what then is on the future? You were talking about um, some possible new opioids coming out. Are they going to be yeah. stronger and less addictive or still have the same well, side effects but more effective? Yeah, so the, so, the hope is, so the hope is that we can take advantage of the analgesic properties of opioids without the problems. And um, so when you activate a mu opioid receptor, um, what you're doing is you're plugging something into the external part of the cell and inside the cell on the, on the intramembrane side of that receptor, it actually activates two pathways, uh, which for the purposes of this conversation, we're going to call the G protein pathway and the beta arrestin pathway. Um, so, um, out of curiosity, some, some clever scientists were saying, well, okay, what happens if you activate one of those pathways but not the other? Could you separate the pain relief from the other side effects that it has, including the respiratory depression, the nausea, the itch, the constipation, and so forth? So, they built a mouse that was a beta arrest and knockout mouse. 
So Sorry, they built a the mouse like they 3D they printed it. Out. They do this all the time. When you go to pain conferences, they say we had this idea, so we built a mouse. Um, so they built it. So they built a mouse that had beta arrest and knocked out. And when they gave, so so those were those were mouses where or mice <laughs> where you um, you give them a strong opioid and it only activates the G protein pathway. Now those mice got good analgesia. And they got very few of the other major side effects of the opioids, such as nausea and um, respiratory depression. So they could give these mice quite high doses to the point where they were getting quite sedated, but their breathing didn't slow down. And obviously, the respiratory depression is the major thing about um, you know taking a strong opioid, which can be potentially life-threatening in overdose. So the idea was to actually, um, if you could find opioid molecules which stimulated the mu receptor, but which had a strong bias towards the G protein pathway and not the beta arrestin pathway. So the first one of these was a substance developed in 2013 called TRV130, which um, graduated to actually get a drug name called oloceridine. And oloceridine uh, worked beautifully on rats, sailed through all its trials, um, in phase two human trials, it did seem to be an effective analgesic, uh, did seem to cause less nausea, less vomiting, less respiratory depression. Um, the phase three trials for oliseridine, which is the last phase before you actually get human release, um, were not really accepted by the FDA as being all that impressive. So unfortunately, oliseridine is still sitting there on the shelf at the pharma company waiting to be developed. Um, probably not going to be released. There's another one called PZM21, which also looked extremely good, but had one bad animal study, so it died. And the most interesting one recently was CYX6, uh, developed in Queensland by the postdoc of one of our, um, you know, one of the people I know, uh, Marie Smith up there at the University of Queensland. And this was a highly biased G protein agonist, which I'm very excited about. In the rats, it markedly reduced respiratory depression and constipation um, and did seem to be a very effective analgesic. Uh, but unfortunately, when they were doing doses in the upper range, uh, quite a few of those rats had seizures. So it's probably, I, I gather, not going to be developed into a drug for humans. Um, but, you know, it's very exciting to see that, you know, there are, there are ways we can try and tweak these opioid molecules, which have been around for centuries and centuries mm. with very little change. Um, but there, now that we understand that you know, what we want is a G protein biased opioid, not just any opioid, um, those are, and if we get some ones of those which we can use in humans, then uh, you know we'll be up and running. And so, if we can do that, if we can target just that G protein pain relief pathway, is that still going to have the addictive problems that conventional opioids have, or is it? bypassing that as well it's 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 hard to say because some of the uh, some of the addictive effects of opioids aren't mediated through the mu receptor um through they're mediated through the kappa and delta receptors but these ones which i've been looking at are very strongly um biased towards the mu receptor over the other two so that some of the ones that are very good for pain relief, like your, uh, you know, morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl, and those, are very strong mu agonists, and so that makes them relatively clean drugs as far as other effects go. Um, but the question will be with these drugs when you put them into humans, does it activate those dopamine reward pathways um, in the brainstem, which are the ones that really, uh, you know mediate the addictive potential but we do have two drugs at the moment buprenorphine and tapentadol which are currently available and are currently used which these days we refer to as the atypical opioids because those are drugs which are actually as good a painkillers as the strong opioids but they don't seem to have the same potential for addiction or dose escalation or tolerance and so, uh, so the current sort of wave of thinking is to try and get everyone onto using the uh, atypical opioids as much as possible um, and, uh, you know, try and avoid the traditional strong mu opioids like morphine and fentanyl oxycodone as much as possible. Excellent. 
but presumably they still have the other side effects the constipation the uh depressed breathing that's uh, right. no well, well well certainly the the buprenorphine actually has a ceiling effect for its respiratory depression so it will suppress your breathing to a certain modest amount but no further no matter how much higher you go mm -hmm. and uh tapentadol was originally introduced uh in australia about three or four years ago and uh based on the safety data um, in terms of its safety in overdose, it, it's actually looking like there is some serious conversations happening that it may be actually down scheduled from Schedule 8, which is regulating it as a strong opioid, down to Schedule 4, which is uh, regulating it as just an ordinary drug, because it seems not to produce significant respiratory depression or, in fact, uh, seems to be very rarely, if ever, associated with overdose deaths. So that's really good news. That is. It sounds like we are, are slowly getting to a point where we can dig ourselves out of these problems then with future medications. Absolutely. And, and look, you know, if we just use what we've currently got sensibly, um, we'll have fewer problems in five years now than we do uh, at the moment. But if we get drugs um, which become available which, uh, you know, don't have the traditional opioid baggage but do have the, you know, the strong mu receptor pain relief, then, uh, you know, so much the better. But, you know, my money's on the Chinese red-headed scorpion uh, centipede, rather. <laughs> yeah, I think those ones are still those ones are still coming. Those ones are still coming. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's actually one of those NAV 1.7. I've, I've talked on the show before about yeah. the uh, the redhead yeah. centipede, and but there is actually uh, a NAV 1.7 receptor blocker, which is derived from tarantula venom, which is currently leading the race in that regard. So, so I'm it's, still I'm still betting on those. So it's scorpions, it's tarantulas. I think it was the black mamba snake as well, wasn't there at one point? Another one. Yep. Yep. So yep. we're looking to nature once again to get us out of trouble. Venoms are amazing. Venoms. <laughs> <laughs> now, Penny, we're all familiar with dolphins and their snouts. We think of bottlenose dolphins, for example. But river dolphins have longer snouts that can be almost twice as long as the rest of their skulls. And between 5 and 20 million years ago, there was a dolphin, now extinct, called Uranodelphus, which means well-nosed. And it had a snout that was five times longer than its brain case. And of course, the big question is why? Yeah, I thought this was really interesting. And it's not the only one. So a lot of these ancient or these dolphin ancestors had really, really long snouts. And apparently some of them had more teeth than any other mammals. So up to 350 teeth, which is a lot of teeth. Um, and apparently people have been describing them for a long time. But no one's really gone much further in naming them and saying, yeah, big snout. And I mean, look, as someone who reads a lot of, um, a lot of books about prehistoric sort of animals pitched at the four-year-old <laughs> market. Um, yeah, like, you really yeah. need to broaden your reading uh, library oh, there. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's all these things. Yep, they existed. They had a long snout. Things were weird back in the day. But it's really interesting to think about why. So what good does this snout do them? Um, and the other thing is that it doesn't look like they're all from the same lineage. These snouts evolved on three separate occasions in the Miocene, so between 5 and 23 million years ago. So That's so cool. Like Another case of convergent evolution, the same thing yeah. evolving separately three times. Yeah, so something in the environment must have been driving that. So what was going on? in the Miocene and what benefit might having might having a long snout you know give to a dolphin so the snouts weren't all the same so some of them were sort of flat some of them were circular and so on and the idea is that maybe this let them hunt a bit better so they could actually use their snout to stun fish so like the flat snout could sort of sweep the water from side to side. Other ones were the circular ones. You might able to sort of, you know, attack in every direction like a marlin, which is pretty cool. But why the Miocene? Why not today? So this happened when ocean temperatures were climbing. Um, 
Here's something I'd never really thought about. When it's cold, if you have warm blood, you have a bit of an advantage over a cold-blooded prey mm. because fish and stuff are going to be more sluggish in cold temperatures, but if the ocean's a bit warmer, fish are going to be a bit faster. So perhaps fish were moving faster, the dolphins lost their advantage and these long snouts somehow you know, helped them be better hunters or get, you know, get more prey more effectively. The other thing is that because the oceans were, everything was warmer, um, sea levels rose, which flooded the shorelines and made a whole lot of new kind of habitats. So it could be that, um, you know, there's all these new environments, new niches, new habitats that could be occupied by dolphins. And yeah, it's interesting. It's a period of, I guess, evolutionary diversification in a way, or, you know, changing. I guess we said they all were converging and evolving the same thing, but other, other kinds of um, body shapes were evolving too, um, not just these long snouts. So some had tusks, some had big underbites and so on. But as, well, a common theme with us is, you know, climate change happened and all of this diversity disappeared. In this case, it was... Um, cooling so the temperature fell the climate became you know less stable there was a whole bunch of ice ages it wasn't as nice anymore and you know maybe in the long term we might think oh you know what if people stuff up the planet if dolphins survive maybe in 10 million years there'll be some really interesting species <laughs> super fast gonna, fish anyway <laughs> super fast fish but in the, in the short term like yeah like um you can have great diversity and climate change can effectively put a stop to that if it makes it really difficult to survive, that kind of um, punctuated equilibrium kind of idea. But anyway, I really was interested. Um, the reason I liked this story was thinking about, yeah, like stuff has have weird features and you're like, yeah, that's weird. Oh, well, yeah. things were weird 20 million years ago. But, yeah, like I hadn't thought of, you know, you thinking of hunting or things like that. So, that was pretty cool. Be honest, Penny. The real reason you liked this story was it's another one by Ed Yong with the oh, title yeah, absolutely. Why the Long Why Face, the long Extinct, face Dolphin. Extinct Dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he does have a talent for um, making Good stories interesting to read about. Yeah. And I like the thought that... Uh, as the, the ocean's warmer and the fish are getting faster, the dolphins are like, they're just getting that little bit faster from me. I, I, need, a, I need a slightly longer nose to get them slightly yeah. longer. And this sort of Lamarckian idea of the nose growing to catch them mm. faster. Uh, but no, it's very cool. And yeah, as you say, that diversification that happens, the different climate changes, fascinating. Mm. Well, let's move on then and talk about cooperation. Except in group assignments at university, humans are generally quite good at working together. <laughs> but it's not just a human thing. There are lots of primates that are known to collaborate, um, whether it be hunting in groups or tribal rivalries. So a team of researchers from the University of Michigan devised a battery of tests to evaluate the decision-making in chimpanzees. What did they find? Well, essentially, in a nutshell, what they found is that in these tests, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, if a chimp made a decision to be cooperative or pro-social, that decision was made a lot more quickly than if they decided to be selfish. So in one of the tests, for example, um, they had a choice, the chimps had a choice. They could either provide food to themselves and a human sort of partner, an experimenter, and there was a whole little sequence of, you know, a human reaching for the food and so on to indicate that they wanted it. So if they decided, yep, I'll share, or we'll, we'll both get food, that was quite a quick decision. Which if they decided, nope, the food is just for me, that took a little bit longer. And that idea is that the pro-social, that cooperative response and yeah, chimps are not known for being a particularly cooperative species. Um, 
Yeah, I get like you, Ed. I was reading about how humans are like hyper cooperative and ul- mm-hmm. ultra cooperative. I think, really? What the <laughs> are you on? Like, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, look, here we are cooperating over the internet. We can't even see each other. And yeah. I've never even met Mick, I think. So, you know, so there we go. But yeah. So, okay, so going back yeah. to that uh, example back to the with the, um, mm. the human partner, and um, so when they were making a selfish decision to keep it all for it themselves. There was, there was like yeah. a hesitation where they were sort yeah, of going. Yeah, it it's, it, and what this has been interpreted as is that the, the cooperative choice is the, the real automatic response. Mm. Um, to be selfish takes a bit of thought essentially or, you know, some cognitive involvement. Like uh, I'm not going to do what. My, my instinct, or not instinct, but you know what I mean? Mm. Um, that, that kind of makes sense, though, because if there's another creature who could potentially be a threat, if you share your food with them or whatever, they're less likely to pick a fight with you. But if you want to keep it all for yourself, you have to weigh that decision. Can I risk it? Are they going to attack me? Yeah. But I think, I think the, the interesting thing there, though, is you could easily make that argument the other way. You could actually also say that if they were going to share it, they would think about what that would cost them and is it easier to be selfish or is it easier to share? Mm-hmm. And and what this actually seems to show is that is that our brains are wired or the you know, mammalian brain seems to find uh, collaboration easier and less cognitively demanding yeah, than being then... selfish, which is kind of the opposite to what I would have expected actually. Mm. It is, isn't it? And it was interesting to think about to read the discussion in the paper, it was sort of saying that um, that this co- cooperativeness has to be like really successful for it to take on. You know, it's um, it's not one of those things where oh, if it's just slightly more successful, off you go. Like it really has to work for it to be um, sort of adopted or evolved, I guess, which is quite interesting too. And the other thing I liked about this study was that they also did a couple of tests to assess each individual chimp's sort of self-control, you know, so how did they respond, not just in the the social um, tests, but to, you know, like, do you want food now or more food later, that one we always hear about. The marshmallow test. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I think they did it with bananas. (laughs) And that seemed, the the chimps with more, this Socialness and um, self-control didn't really seem to be related to each other. So the task Did they that, check the socioeconomic class of the chimps? Oh, I know. Were, right? Well, there was one chimp who refused, <laughs> refused to participate in the experiment and was excluded, refused to make a choice. Um, <laughs> that's not very cooperative. <laughs> that's not very cooperative. <laughs> but, yeah, so the apes, the chimps had to decide... Um, if they were going to give food to a human or not, there was another test where um, there was a little skit set up between two experimenters and the first one was playing with a stick. The second one ran in and took the stick and chucked it into the chimp's room. And then the first one was like gesturing to the chimp saying, you know, help, help, help me get it back. And, you know, looking, making eye contact with the chimp and with the stick and so on. And um, it seemed that they, that chimps would, really robustly help out if the human made it obvious that they needed help, but not if they didn't care, if they didn't show what they wanted, which suggests that they're not just returning the object because, oh, it was thrown back, but out of a a, a A response to a social kind of situation. Mm. Yeah. And the other one that they did was a punishment task where if someone stole food, the chimp could choose to, like, get that food away by pulling on a rope which collapsed a table. So, <laughs> yeah, so, and the chimps, yeah, and again, like, when they made the, the social decision, it was, on the whole, it was um, faster than the selfish choice. So I thought that was interesting, like, and not just because of what it says about humans, you know, if we are allegedly so ultra cooperative. Although, yeah, I guess we are. Um, some of us are. Some of us are. Yeah, some of us wouldn't even um, 
chuck back a stick that someone threw <laughs> over the <laughs> But, um, yeah. So I think the interesting thing yeah. about that one too for me is that um, is that they, they they needed to show they needed to signal that they wanted mm, cooperation. Yeah, and and I think you know because there's been a lot of stuff about theory of mind and what sort of theory of mind do chimpanzees have, mm. and you know for them to sort of watch that situation unfold, but but they don't instinctively go to help unless that. That yeah. um, one asks for help. It, it would suggest that maybe they're not reading the emotional cues of the situation. They're waiting for the emotional cues of the individuals to be signaled to them. Mm. And so yeah. maybe that's not, not not quite as impressive a theory of mind as what we've you know previously thought they might add. It's quite yeah, interesting. It is. It um, it's basically a. Another factor, and the, there's a big debate uh, amongst biologists uh, about altruism and why animals will do something that they don't necessarily get a benefit mm. from. Uh, mm. And, and if there's, there's calculated uh, altruism, which is, I'm going to do something for you because you've done something for me recently or in case you do something for me later on mm. sort of thing. I think it's, it's a fascinating topic to look into and... Um, this is just really cool experiments that they did. Yeah. De definitely, definitely. If the altruistic response is less cognitively demanding, that's a huge finding, actually, because that really explains why. That, I mean, that's a big thing in favour of it being the instinctive response. Because um, I, I must say, I've always sort of thought the altruistic thing is would be the one that would be more cognitively demanding, because you would have to think you would instinctively act selfishly. And and you would would take more effort to think about how it might benefit you to be altruistic, but if your instinct is to be altruistic and you have to think about being selfish, that would actually make a lot of sense. It's also a really well structured experiment too. I think they have got a fairly good data set of forty um, wild born, semi free ranging chimpanzees from this sanctuary in uh, Republic of Congo, um, which is a lot bigger sample size than a lot of other previous experiments into this sort of a thing so uh pretty robust methodology there i think it's yeah just very interesting all around and i think that's our show and as always all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com 316 and if you go to scienceontop.com donate you can help us out and become a patreon Mick, is there anything you want to plug or shout out? Uh, no, I just want to plug. I just want to think, say everyone else should be a patron like me <laughs> because uh, it's uh, I've got I've got a number of podcasts I listen to. I don't watch TV. I don't listen to the radio anymore. I just do podcasts, and I'm quite happy to spend a few bucks each episode uh, listening to this sort of stuff. So uh, you know, everyone should do it if they enjoy the podcast. I want to point out Mick is not on because he paid. <laughs> this is not how it works. <laughs> but uh, no, we do appreciate that uh, a lot, Mick. Uh, so thanks for that. Thanks for joining us today, Mick and Tenny. No worries. Thanks. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. And insist has been investigated for some of its practices surrounding a drug they made containing fentanyl, an opioid which can be 100 times more powerful than morphine. Their drug is only approved for cancer patients, but INSYS is accused of not just pushing it for non-cancer patients, but even helping convince insurance companies to pay for it. And to do that, according to one ex-employee, they used a particularly shady technique. If you don't have cancer and break through cancer pain, no insurance company is going to pay for this medication. So... If you call up and you tell them that the patient doesn't have cancer, it's automatically denied. So instead, what were you doing? They would always ask, does the patient have cancer? Uh-huh. That's what we would say. So you do uh-huh. You would right. say yes. But I'm not saying yes, right? I would just say uh-huh. Isn't that a yes? Well, and that's what they did think. Um, but I wasn't blatantly saying yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> Except everybody knows uh-huh means yes. If you go to thesaurus.com and type in aha, literally the first word that comes up is yes, followed by options such as absolutely, definitely, unquestionably, and yep.